The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a student called Janet talking on the phone to the manager of a sports centre about a job. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, White Water Sports Centre. Hello, I wanted to inquire about a job at the centre. Right, I'll just put you through to the manager. Hello, Steve Thompson speaking. Hello, um, my name's Janet Willis. Um, I'm looking for a part-time job and I saw an ad saying that you have some vacancies. I was wondering what sort of people you're looking for. Well, at present we're looking for a part-time pool attendant. I don't know if you're interested in that. Oh, yes, definitely. OK. Well, have you done this sort of job before? Oh, yes. I've spent the last three summers working for children's summer camps, so I did a lot of pool supervision. And I'm actually a sports student. Water sports is my special area. OK. Well, no need to ask if you can swim, then. No, I'm certainly not afraid of the water. So what does the job at the pool involve? You'd mainly be responsible for supervising the swimmers. We have to watch them all the time, obviously, in case of accidents. So you'd have regular shifts there. OK. Then, as well as that, you'd have to look after the equipment that's used by the beginners' classes. Right. And would I be involved in teaching them at all? I'd be quite interested in that. Well, they have their own instructor, so that's not really part of the job. The attendance job does involve taking regular water quality tests. But you wouldn't be involved in cleaning the pool or anything like that. OK. And the ad said you wanted someone just twice a week? Yes, that's right. Can I choose which days? Uh... <laughs> Well, if you'd rung up earlier, you could have done, but I'm afraid it's got to be Mondays and Wednesdays. We got someone for Tuesdays and Thursdays, and the weekends are already fully staffed. Is that going to be a problem for you? No, that should be all right. And the ad said it was evening work, right? Yeah, you start at 6, and the pool closes at 9.30, but you wouldn't get away until 10 by the time you've checked the lockers and changing rooms. Fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And how much do you pay? The basic hourly rate is $15, but it would go up to 19 for someone with the right qualifications. Well, I've got life-saving certificates and first aid qualifications. Oh. Well, with that and your experience, you'd probably get the maximum rate then. Obviously, you'd have to come along for an interview if you're interested. Oh, it sounds just the job I'm looking for. Shall we fix a time for the interview now? OK. Uh, it's Janet, isn't it? Yeah, Janet Willis. How about Friday morning, Janet? Around 11? Oh, sorry. I have lectures, but I could make the afternoon. 2pm? Fine. And can I just check on where you are? Is it Finden Avenue? No, it's 23 to 27 Farnden Avenue. That's F-A-R-N-D-O-N. It's off Eastgate. East Gate. Fine. I'll look forward to meeting you then. OK. So if you need to phone me before then, you can get through to me directly on 053 210. Is there anything I need to bring along to the interview? Well, you do need to fill in an application form. I'll put one in the post for you so you can fill that in and bring it along.
You don't want me to post it back to you? No. Just remember to bring it along with you. What about references? Should I bring any? Nah, but do have your certificates with you when you come. We need to see those. Great. Thanks very much then. I'll see you on Friday. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello everyone. Now here you all are, new university students. And the first question you probably have is, what is a student union? Another question is, do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded. So, joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question. What are we? We are a formal organisation, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises and organise ourselves as we wish. And our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well. The student union organised all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions and, as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, let me tell you more about the student union and its basic functions. In general, there are three, social, organisational and representational. Let's look at the first one. 
Basically, the union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear. In other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to twenty percent discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper, and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right. Let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue, if you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear part of a talk about attending a science festival. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now I think nearly all of you have received confirmation of your school placements for next term, and as part of your activities, we will be asking you to take responsibility for promoting a school visit to the Norchester Science Festival. Of course, the head of science at your school will be aware of the festival and should have all the details of it. But all the heads of science at your schools will be looking to you to be the main organizer and motivator of a visit to the festival. They'll give you the documents you need. We hope that you will motivate pupils at your schools to take an interest in the festival. It runs for three days. There are day tickets and special three-day tickets, and schools have the extra option of a two-day ticket. We hope you will encourage your pupils to visit it on one or two days, but most important of all, we hope you will use the festival to generate a lively interest in science that will last all year round, and provide the school with a lasting benefit. This will, with luck, lead to improved examination results in science subjects, and let's not forget, we hope your pupils will have a lot of fun too. Needless to say, your performance in achieving these aims will count towards your final exam grade at the end of the year. 
Now, let me just say a few words on why a science festival. Science is part of our everyday world in a way that is different now from before. Of course, we are used to having the benefit of scientific inventions. We are used to the aeroplane, the motor car, the space rocket, and so on. But now we live in a truly scientific age, which means one where inventions and improvements are matters of routine rather than occasional and unusual events. We have become a really scientific society. Yet we find that we are failing to interest and enthuse the young in this. Fewer young people are choosing to study science at school after the age of 16, and even fewer at university. As a result, we have fewer teachers coming into schools to teach science. And many science teachers are not teaching their specialism. For example, I know of several cases where maths is being taught by biologists and chemistry is being taught by physicists. We urgently need another 3,000 science teachers in England at least. That's why we look to you, the science teachers who are starting off your careers, to inject enthusiasm and wonder into the study of science. And we hope the Norchester Festival will help you to do this. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, enough of the background. What about the festival? There are three main venues where the festival events take place. These are the Millennium Library, the Town Hall, not the Town Hall itself, but the Town Hall Conference Centre, and the Norchester Theatre. Now, when you are planning your visits, Remember that many of the activities for younger pupils will be at the Millennium Library and the secondary school pupils may find more to interest them in the Conference Centre. Now, just so that you have some immediate information, I'd like to mention a few of the events that are taking place this year. One event of special interest to people living in this area is called Waterworld. This is a clay model of the southeast of England and the presenters show you the effects of rising sea levels as a result of climate change. They ask the audience to select the rise in sea level, for example, 20 or 40 or 60 centimetres, and the model shows the places that would be flooded as a result. Watch out for your town. Does it sink or does it swim? Transport 2050 is about transport options for our towns in the future. A number of experts will introduce the topic and then everyone at the event will have a chance to speak and give their views. Science in a Suitcase is a comedy act by two scientists who do crazy experiments and sing songs and play the clown to large audiences every afternoon. I'm particularly looking forward to that one, which should be entertaining. Ropes and Hangings is an interactive event which will be of interest to young people in which, after experimenting with ropes and bricks, they build a real suspension bridge. That kind of hands-on activity is always really popular. And, appealing to a different audience, there is Paper and Time, in which some experts will be showing us the techniques they use for the conservation of ancient books and manuscripts. This will obviously not be for everybody, but it should be interesting just to see how they do it. Now, let's move on to tickets and transport to the festival. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 4. Part 4. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. I'm glad you all found your way here. Now I'd like Dr. Wallace to introduce us to the Arboretum. Good afternoon. Although at first glance the Arboretum may look like a park, it is a research and teaching facility that also provides a place for people to develop a positive relationship with nature. When then University of Wisconsin-Madison purchased the land, mostly during the 1930s. Much of it bore little resemblance to its pre-settlement state. Instead, it had been turned into cultivated fields and pastures that had fallen into disuse. The university's arboretum committee decided, early on, to try to bring back the plants and animals that had lived on the land before its development. Though they may not have anticipated it at the time, the committee's foresight resulted in the Arboretum's ongoing status as a pioneer in the restoration and management of ecological communities. In focusing on the re-establishment of historic landscape, particularly those that predated large-scale human settlement, they introduced a whole new concept in ecology, ecological restoration. The process of returning an ecosystem or piece of landscape to a previous, usually more natural, condition. Madison was a fast-growing city in the 1920s. Fortunately, some leading citizens recognised the need to preserve open space for Madison's residents. Most of the Arboretum's current holdings came from purchases these civic leaders made during the Great Depression. In addition to inexpensive land, the Depression brought a ready supply of hands to work it. Between 1935 and 1941, crews from the Civilian Conservation Corps were stationed at the Arboretum and provided most of the labour needed to begin establishing ecological communities within the Arboretum. Efforts to restore or create historic ecological communities have continued over the years, with the result that the Arboretum's collection of restored ecosystems is not only the oldest, but also the most extensive such collection. In addition to these native plant and animal communities, the Arboretum, like most Arboreta, has traditional collections of labelled plants arranged in garden-like displays. These horticultural collections, featuring trees and shrubs of the world, are the state's largest woody plant collections. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.